Hi, this is Kelsey Fukowski for AP Cup Review. And in our final installment on the federal bureaucracy, we're going to be looking at the bureaucracy as a regular, and we're also going to be looking at some of the criticisms or pathologies that are labeled against the federal bureaucracy. So let's get started. So there has been somewhat of a movement towards deregulation. And of course, that is the lifting of restrictions on business, industry, and professional activities. So when you have the regulation, you have fewer rules. So that might be having fewer rules with respect to the environment as to where a pipeline can go or having fewer restrictions on the stock market. And some blame deregulation as to one of the reasons for the collapse of the financial economy uh, to some extent in 2007, 2008. Some of the reasons why people want to get rid of regulatory problems is it raises prices, it uh, hurts U.S. competitive positions abroad because you have more rules, and sometimes it doesn't work well. But again, you're going to have those who are going to argue that regulation is needed, and you typically see this with Democrats and those who tend to be more liberal, that they want more regulation because regulation you know, sets rules and in some ways can be helpful. For example, do you want you know, national parks to be preserved? Do you want that to be preserved for the future? Uh, and you're going to have people arguing that you, you certainly want to protect that. And again, it goes both ways that some see regulation as being a good thing, others, of course, seeing it not. And again, this sometimes comes down to ideology. So presidents check on the growth of bureaucracy. It is very much a check, even though it's within its own particular branch. But the president has appointments, especially to the cabinets and, of course, to the director and those who are going to be on the agency. Now, also, the president is going to check the bureaucracy by issuing executive orders. These orders carry the force of law and are used to implement policies. Uh, so, again, it will instruct the bureaucracy as to how to enforce a certain rule of regulation. It can also organize an agency. For example, uh, after 9-11, George W. Bush created the Department of Homeland Security. So that's very important to understand that the president certainly has checks on the bureaucracy from appointment power to issuing executive orders. Probably that's the biggest one. And then reorganizing an agency. Moving on, in terms of Congress trying to control the bureaucracy, uh, certainly they can influence the appointment of an agency head. Remember that the Senate has the power of confirmation. And you see this whether, you know, the Senate might reject a presidential nominee to a cabinet. So that's very important. Perhaps another and, and arguably the biggest power of Congress trying to control the bureaucracy is that it can alter an agency's budget. Remember the, that Congress has the power of the purse and it can easily defund an agency. It can also uh, hold oversight hearings as part of legislative oversight. So certainly if there is an issue uh, within one of the cabinets or you want to see why something went wrong or why this particular agency is spending more money, Congress can hold hearings. They can also rewrite legislation or make it more detailed as to how to instruct uh, the bureaucracy for, for carrying out the law, because remember that uh, bureaucracy is essentially the action figure of government. And then last but not least, Congress can always abolish a particular agency uh, or a bureaucracy. So that's important to know. That So Congress does have a lot of responsibility and does have a lot of power in terms of trying to control bureaucracy. Remember, Congress and the executive branch, particularly the president, share dual responsibility in terms of overseeing the bureaucracy. So also with respect to bureaucracy, going in another direction, you have what are called iron triangles. And if you recall from our discussion on interest groups, these are a mutually dependent relationship between the bureaucratic agency, the interest group, and congressional committees or subcommittees. Remember, each exists uh, independent of one another. Uh, and one of the reasons why they're called an iron triangle, think iron is very difficult to penetrate. They are very tough uh, to get rid of. Um, but, you know, some are going to argue that uh, iron triangles are now being replaced by issue networks, that, that really iron triangles, as you see in this particular graph here, are a little too simplistic. Uh, if you recall here uh, with this iron triangle with respect to tobacco, notice it's almost like you scratch my back, I scratch your back, right? The interest group 
is going to provide information about the industry to the bureaucracy. To, uh, in this case, it could be the Department of uh, Agriculture, the tobacco um, division. It also provides support for the agency's budget requests, and then vice versa, it will provide rulings and sometimes favorable rulings for the interest groups, the tobacco lobby. And then again, you see how it works between the congressional subcommittee and the bureaucracy and so forth. So that this really, this iron triangle is very, very difficult to penetrate. So moving on, um, you know, here are a couple other uh, iron triangle examples, but uh, looking at really uh, the issue network, really it's seen as being more complicated than the iron triangle where you just have three separate groups. It's argued by those who favor the issue network that the iron triangle is just simply too simple and that there are many interest groups on the opposite side of an issue who are trying to compete. So those who favor an issue network, you know, really are going to see this as being more complex. It's including the media that debates an issue and it really slows the policy making process. It's not as smooth as you, you know, as you would see with the iron triangle. It's much, much more complex. And while, you know, you can have a president can appoint an agency head who steers policy, it, at the end of the day, the president can never really smoothly control the policy. And that can be very difficult. So if you look here, uh, look at the differences uh, with the Iron Triangle. Very simple here, three main groups. But notice that the issue network with respect to environmental policy, you know, you have the many, many departments here, cabinets, and they're all competing with congressional committees and interest groups. And it makes it very, very difficult to really steer policy. All right, continuing on, bureaucracy and the scope of government. So the size of bureaucracy is an example of government out of control, especially if you, you take it from a conservative perspective. But at the end of the day, even though the size of the bureaucracy has shrunk, especially, you know, you, you don't really see expansion at the federal level. You see it more at the state and local level. Still, some want it to... Uh, really be smaller in size. Some agencies, of course, don't have enough resources to do what they're expected. Um, the bureaucracy is only going to carry out the policy. Remember, they are the action figures in Congress, and the president has to decide what needs to be done. Congress needs to decide how much is it going to be funded, how many resources is that particular bureaucratic agency going to receive. So that is important to note as well. But the president really, and this is really important to note about how the president tries to control the bureaucracy, the president's going to have a very difficult time controlling cabinet level agencies for the following reasons. Agencies often have political um, support from interest groups, as we saw in the Iron Triangle, and the agency staff often have information and technical expertise that the president or his or her advisors just simply lack. So as a result, they are really in control. They really have a more technical expertise on it. Because remember, a president can't be well-versed in every single uh, domain area from agriculture to homeland security to commerce to energy. And these are very, very difficult, especially when they're uh, intricate. So civil servants who remain in the administration, you know, as administrations change and presidents change, are going to develop a greater loyalty to their agencies than actually to the president. So when the president tries to control or steer policy, that bureaucrat is actually going to really have a much greater, in, in many ways, a much greater loyalty to that bureaucratic agency than to that president. And of course, Congress is always going to be competing for influence over the bureaucracy, just like the president. So you sometimes do have a tug of war with that dual responsibility. Some of the criticisms, though, of or what's known as pathologies of the bureaucracy, certainly there's a lot of red tape. There's a lot of procedures that sort of stereotype that bureaucracies never get anything done. Everything's mired in, in red tape. You can certainly have conflict within the bureaucracy or even between Congress and the president. Certainly duplication. Uh, remember in another video how many different agencies were responsible for some form or some aspect of border security. Um, so as a result, duplication is seen as an issue. Unchecked growth, especially at the state and local level, not so much the federal level. Sometimes bureaucracies are seen as being wasteful and that they also have a lack of accountability, despite the fact that, you know, the executive branch, particularly the president and Congress, do have some oversight. But again, these are some of the common criticisms, probably the biggest one being waste or red tape. So some suggestions for reform, limiting appointments, 
uh, six to 12 years, making it easier to fire a bureaucrat. It is actually very, very difficult and can take a very long time. Also, ideas include rotating professionals amongst agencies, both in and out, rewarding employee initiatives, and even deregulating them in terms of having fewer rules and trying to emphasize customer satisfaction for the bureaucrats. And just to give you an example here, if you want to pause your screen, I'm not going to really stay on it for that long. But firing a bureaucrat, just to show you how long it would take, you would have to follow all six of these steps uh, here. So that can be a very time consuming and actually very costly process. So in summary, bureaucrats do shape policies uh, as administrators. They are implementers and very much important here, they are regulators as well. Remember their primary responsibility is of course implementation of the public policy and bureaucracy has not grown but it actually has shrunk somewhat. Again, that's at the federal level. So let's end with a review question. So all of the following are ways that Congress tries to control the bureaucracy, except take a moment, pause your screen if you have to. All right, and if you said choice E, fire officials, you are correct. Choices A through D are, of course, ways that Congress exercises some checks and balances over the bureaucracy.